Good morning, everyone. It's glad to be back. I'm glad to be back here after one year. And um, my presentation today, the topic is why a strong brand name is crucial for your product's success. Now, before I continue any further, I must make a disclaimer because yesterday I got a few questions and I got to set the record straight. I am not related to Gabriel Pereira. Now, although I'm not related to Gabriel Pereira, but yesterday from his talk, you would have realized that he has, his angle was pretty much uh, from a marketing perspective on promotions. And uh, my topic is actually further upstream. After you have discovered a compound, one of the first things that you would do after patenting it would be getting a brand name. So this is what it's going to be and how important it is. So before I start, I would just like to find out how many of you here are from the marketing departments? Can you just raise your hand? Oh, that's a very small group. Anyone from R&D? Okay, great. So I guess you guys are the ones who would probably be responsible besides the corporate strategy guys with selecting names. So what I would like you to do now is um, just take a pen and on a piece of paper, could you just write down your most favorite brand or the brand that comes to your mind, top of mind, just one. If you could just spend a moment just writing that down. Thank you. Are we done? Okay. So, moving on. How many of you believe that a strong brand name is crucial for your brand success or product success? Okay, that's quite a few. How many of you do not believe that it's important? Okay, no takers. How many of you, no matter what I ask, will not respond? <laughs> Maybe it's the time of the day. <laughs> Now, if you think that a, brand, a strong brand name is not important, I'm going to project an image now, and I want you to think of this guy. He's a pretty popular guy. Think of him and uh, try to reflect how much his name may have influenced his achievements. Bolt became the world's fastest man. Did his name influence his achievement? We don't know. So since he's going to retire, let's wait for his biography. Now the topics that I'm going to go through very quickly are going to be some examples of very strong brand names. Uh, by the way, you do not need to take any shots of these slides. I will be passing it on to Duxus, who will you know, um, let you all know if you want to download it. What is the impact of uh, strong brand names? How it can help your company as well? not just the product. And we'll go through some examples of bad, very bad brand names. And finally, how do you go about creating a brand name? So, let's start off with the strong brand names. Everybody is familiar with Kleenex. If you have gone through any kind of, uh, if you have done an MBA or any kind of marketing course, you'd find that every marketing book has examples of Kleenex and Thermos, where Kleenex became so popular that eventually it became a generic term. Kleenex meant tissues. So people used to say, pass me a Kleenex, instead of passing me, pass me a tissue. The same thing happened with Thermos as well. Thermos flask became so popular that people bought Thermos rather than a flask. Of course, now Thermos is no longer popular, so, and there are hundreds of other brands out there. But Tupperware, I do not know if you belong to my generation, but I still use the generic term Tupperware, meaning any plastic container. So I will tell some people, please pack the food in this Tupperware, although it's another brand altogether. So that's the power of brand names. You know, you can become generic. So those are all, all old examples. New example is Google. How often do we say, Google it? It has become a verb now. A noun has become a verb. We don't say Bing it, although Bing is a search engine. <laughs> right? So we stick with Google. So that's the power. Now, in certain countries where FedEx is very popular, you don't say courier this document, you say FedEx it. One name is missing here, that is the Xerox. Is Xerox, yeah. That, uh, thank you, Dilip. Xerox is a generic term for copying, facsimiles. A few more. Uber. What is, uh, Uber is now a taxi or, or ride-hailing service. It's a German word, but it has come to connote taxi services. Amazon is no longer a jungle or a large river. 
It's the world's largest online retailer for books, CDs, videos, uh, music, MP3 files. Southwest is not a place, it's an airline. And we normally link it with Herb Kelleher, the founder. Disney, still a name, not many people have it, but it is known for its theme parks and family-friendly entertainment. And Pixar, founded by Steve Jobs, very popular as um, for cars, for Toy Story, uh, kids' animation. So you can see from there that a strong brand name will allow your customers to have confidence in your brand, which means if they go to any part of the world, they are assured of the quality of the product or the quality of the service. For example, McDonald's. The process is the same whether it's in Australia, in the US, or even in India. I'm not sure if India still have any more McDonald's. Uh, or any other country, it's the same process. You are assured of the quality. Secondly, it has an elitist uh, attitude as well uh, in some customers. It can drive emotions. Owning a Bentley car has got a different emotional appeal than driving, let's say, um, a Volvo, for example. Right? And I use an Apple Macintosh. All of you know that uh, Apple guys are a, bit, a bunch of snobby guys. Right? So that's the kind of appeal you have. And when you have these two conditions, what will happen is that you can actually apply a higher price to your products because of the confidence it drives in customers as well as the emotional impact. The higher the emotional value, the higher the price you can charge. Higher the price means a higher sales value, and it also means higher profitability and a reputation for your product as well. Now, what encouraged me to give this talk was that a couple of months ago, I started working with um, a supplements company in Europe who was looking for um, suppliers in Malaysia to license their range of products in. But the first thing that hit me was that although the company had a good name, a relevant name, the brand name or the, range, the name for the range of its products reminded me of road traffic signs. So the first thing that hit me was, what does road traffic science have to do with health? Okay, so, so uh, that I've, I felt that if I do a talk like this, it may be of value to some of you, and that's why I'm doing this. Now let's have a look at some human name associations before we move on to brands. This is just to emphasize how powerful names are. If I flash the name Sean Connery, what comes to your mind? 007, James Bond, right? What about Monica Lewinsky? Bill Clinton, okay? And probably some other events as well. Mahatma Gandhi, peaceful resistance. Nelson Mandela, anti-apartheid hero. Now what about Amanda Rao? I know Amanda is somewhere here. I saw her walking in. Thanks, Amanda. How do you, what do you link Amanda Rao to? Testosterone. Uh, what, <laughs> what, I, what I will never forget about Amanda is how yesterday at 3 p.m. she managed to keep me awake with her sex talk. <laughs> so let's have a look at some brand name associations. What do you connect Volvo with, Volvo cars? Safety. But in reality, it's not the safest car, but that's how they marketed themselves. Godiva? Divinely tasty chocolates, which I never share with anyone. Johnny Walker. Johnny Walker only makes whiskies, nothing else. They don't make any other type of spirits, only whiskies. And they have blue label, black label, and so on. And here's a lesson. Johnny Walker's name is so popular that they do not um, link it with any other product that the company may have. So that's a, a, a warning sign. Most companies that actually link their name to another category do not succeed, as in the original category. What is Mayo Clinic known for? Clinical research as well as very high quality healthcare, right? Rich Carlton. Not just hotels, but they are very, very personalized hotels. So personalized that they can even remember 
what your favorite meal during your last day was, what pillow you liked best, what type of blanket, and so on. And what about Shangri-La? It's a mythical place. It doesn't exist, huh? Although a book said that it exists somewhere in Tibet, but nobody ever found it. But a hotel chain has developed that concept of calmness, of serenity. And for those of you who are staying in Shangri-La, you know what I mean. Very high quality. And you'll find the same standard anywhere in the world where Shangri-La is. What about Keen Mind? Who remembers what Keen Mind is? Besides Dilip and the SRI people. Okay, I see only one hand. Dilip, take a look around. Those are your prospective customers. Those who didn't put up your hand. <laughs> now, here is an example of a very bad brand name. This is a Japanese uh, sports ring, and um, it never succeeded outside of Japan. Do you know why? No prizes for guessing, because of the word sweat there. Nobody wants to drink a sports ring with someone's sweat in it. <laughs> it has the yuck factor, the word sweat there. So it has never succeeded in English-speaking countries. And when I say English-speaking countries, I'm talking about Australia, New Zealand, UK, Canada, US, uh, India, Singapore, Malaysia. It never succeeded, right? So that's one very bad example. I have got a series of bad examples now which I'm going to relate to you in a story form. All right? Now, fair warning. You may find this vulgar, bordering on obscenity, but I have to drive home the point of how a bad name can really destroy your brand. All right? Now, let's take the, the, the scenario of this guy by the name of, let's say, Charlie. Any Charlies here? Okay, good. <laughs> There's no Charlie here. So, Charlie has arrived in Singapore. Uh, for the NFAP conference. On the first night, he is uh, famished. He wants to have a meal. He walks out to Orchard Road and um, he sees a shop. Uh, he's familiar with the food, but then the brand is kind of a turn-off. Most of us would not pop into this pizzeria. <laughs> but he decides he might, he's, he's not in the mood for experimenting. You know, uh, Singapore food is a little bit strange for him, so he decides to go here. Now, with a name like this, what do you expect? Um, but Charlie is a pretty observant guy. Now, when they serve the pizza as well as the side dishes, he refused to touch the uh, sauce which was on the table because the name was not very inviting. <laughs> and of course, uh, with a company with this kind of name, the Herpes Pizza, I don't think you would expect them to serve high-quality stuff. Now, this is what they use in their soup as well as the sauce in their pizza, <laughs> right? And, and poor Charlie, when he ordered the soda, they had uh, put it into a mug so he could not see the brand that they served, which was this. <laughs> now, naturally, of course, after having consumed all this, a few hours later when he went back to the hotel, um, he puked, all right? And he soiled his uh, clothing. But it's a good hotel, something like Shangri-La. So in the bathroom, they supplied this detergent, but he was not very comfortable using this brand. <laughs> Although, if, if you read, read the fine print, it says bath means snow. You cannot change a person's mind just by printing this. Okay, it's not going to work. So anyway, that was the least of uh, Charlie's problems. Because he had the runs as well a few hours later. And he ran to the toilet many, many times. And because he was pretty desperate, he didn't mind using this brand of toilet paper. <laughs> Very specific, and uh, maybe he gave him some confidence as well. <laughs> Poor Charlie, he, he was a bit sore after all the runs. Uh, but the hotel once again supplied him the butt paste. It's actually a diaper rash cream. And uh, the fine print says, pleasant scent. I, I don't know if anybody's going to smell Charlie after this. But, but anyway, he used it. And, and coming back to, to you know, post um, uh, emesis, um, when you're very hungry, you want to eat something light, and this is what Charlie ordered from room service. And uh, they served him this, but um, uh, he decided that he would eat it, even though it, it, it had a totally different connotation, actually. And, and um, it was so delicious, so he decided to reorder, and they sent him a bigger version of it. So ladies and gentlemen, um, 
I'm not making this up. These are real brands out there. You can Google it and they exist, okay? And when you see all this, you kind of wonder what were they thinking when they actually selected these brand names? Were they serious about this? Or did they just want to shift the, uh, the product out there? Right? So, moral story is try as far as possible to avoid anatomy or even physiology as part of your brand name. Because you never know how it's going to end up or how people are going to view it. Certain names, like Pokhari Sweat, can work in Japan, but it may not cut it in other, other countries. So, the naming is extremely important. If you get it wrong, you will never be able to correct it unless you spend millions of dollars. That's, that's wasted money, actually. So think carefully before you select a name because it is a strategic decision. It's your name. Um, it is linked to you as the management of the company. Take your time if necessary. Take days, weeks, and even months. It's an important name, right? And some of us may have names that we regret our parents gave us. So, you know, think about that if you have such a name. So let's have a look at some ways, some examples of unique names. And some of these names have instant meaning. Okay? Now when you see this name, what comes to your mind? What do you think these guys do? They are a nursery or a kindergarten. All right? What about these guys? Let me help you. Let me pronounce this word, sweetener. What do you think this product is? Yeah, it's a sweetener. It's actually a, a natural blend of sweeteners developed by one of Matsa's members. Not commercially available. Grab car. Those of you in Southeast Asia, you know that this is Uber's biggest threat in this area, right? Surging sales, any idea? Okay, surging sales is actually a program that uh, my company does, which is a selling skills training program for B2B sales reps. Anybody knows what Verivax is? It's actually varicella vaccine. So Verivax is actually a GSK vaccine. Do you know what Fluorix is? Yeah, it's a flu vaccine, also from GSK. And Brew Works. Anybody has gone to this place? It's actually along Orchard Road, at, right at the T junction. They are a craft beer creator, and they also serve food as well. Right? So you can see from these names that it is pretty instant. You more or less know what they do or what the product promises. Now here are some unique names with, you may have to think about it before you, you realize what they do. Moscurix, do you know what this is? It's not a vaccine against mosquitoes, although you may think that. It's actually a vaccine against malaria being developed by GSK. So if, if I did not tell you, you may think it's a vaccine against yellow fever uh, or even dengue, right? Plendil and Novas are actually two calcium channel blockers which were launched in the 90s, um, indicated for hypertension. Plendil was a product that I launched when I was in Astra. It actually stands for plenty of dilation. In hypertension, your, your, um, uh, your uh, uh, cardiac arteries are actually constricted, so you tend to dilate that. NOVAS probably stands for normal vascularization. Lozac from Astra stands for low secretion, which is their acid pump inhibitor. Imdio, also from Astra. I worked in Astra, so that's why I'm giving quite a lot of examples from there. IMDUR stands for isosorbite mononitrate in dural formulation, which means extended release. Anyone knows what is Androgard beside Amanda, but anybody else? <laughs> Androgard is actually one of Matsa's uh, members' product. Any guesses? It's a supplement. Yeah, it's for andropause, and it contains testophen. Pristine is actually Malaysia's number one selling fish oil. And from the name, you can more or less realize that, you know, the omega-3 is supposed to clear your body of toxins and so on. Now, let's have a look at unique names with no relationship with what the product does. I gave you the example of Uber, a German word that means over or above, but now it has come to connote taxis, ride-hailing, ride-sharing. Delta, a geographical formation which is now an airline, more popular as an airline. Skype has got nothing to do with the sky. Okay, it's an instant messaging or, or voice communication service. Adobe is actually very famous for its PDF documents, very famous for creating a webinar platform, as well as tools for creating or enhancing videos. 
eBay, what has a bay got to do with auctions? Nothing. And finally, Starbucks, what has coffee got to do with the stars? They make big bucks though, okay? So maybe that's what it means. So there are six ways that you can create a unique brand name. First off, would be by misspelling homophones. So an example here is biz, business apps. It's a company that makes apps for businesses. So not the way they pronounce, they, they spell business. Okay, so it's a misspelling. Secondly, friend. Friend is actually a pet app developed by one of my clients. And from the spelling, you can see that the, the word fur is in there. So it's actually for furry mammals or furry pets. So it's not intended for birds or fish or reptiles. And lastly, videos. If you look closely or you pronounce it fast enough, you will tend to realize it's actually the, it's the plural of video. It's actually a video creation software where you can create hundreds of videos in uh, minutes. Second method that you can use is actually by coining words. We have already seen keen mind, okay? We have grab car, we have Instagram. So you can coin words as well. Thirdly, is invent a new word. Now, as I was preparing this presentation, this word came to my mind, Mongol 4. And I did a quick Google to see if it exists. It didn't exist, all right? So it's a new word that I created. I have not copyrighted. If anybody wants it, feel free to use. No royalties required. Alpha numeric, that's another way that you can use. Now, what you find here is this uh, company by name of uh, Great Tops. It's a US company that makes hard tops for cars. They customize uh, hard tops. Secondly, Greater is a company that makes industrial grinders. So you can play around with this alphanumeric versions as well. Make sure it's easy to pronounce though. You can also use an existing word. Periscope is actually a live streaming app owned by Twitter. And um, Telegram is not the old paper-based Telegram service. It's actually an instant messaging service that is competing against WhatsApp. And last but not least, you can use acronyms or even abbreviations. Now, I wonder if the Lazada speaker is already here. Is the Lazada person here? Not here. All right. Now, Lazada, if you Google online, actually is, is an acronym. Each letter stands for something. So it's a value or it can be virtues. Now, I'm not saying Lazada, the online retailer, is using that same formula, but I'm just giving an example. So you can use acronyms. You can also use abbreviations. Um, now, for those Australians who are here, I wonder how many of you know that Qantas is actually an abbreviation. It stands for Queensland and Northern Territory Aerial Services. So from a regional airline, it has become a global uh, airline. So these are the six ways uh, that you can actually create brand names for yourself. And um, the most powerful alphabets that you can use for your brand names are actually five. These are the five. J, K, X, Y, Z, and Z for, for the sake of the Americans who are here. And of these five, the reason why studies say these five are the, most, uh, are the most potent is because not many brand names start with these five letters. Most of them start with A or B or S and so on. S is apparently the longest. So if you have names starting with these less common alphabets, it will make it easier for your customers to remember. And of these five, guess which one is the most potent? Sorry? X? Yep. X is the most potent. And the reason is because it has this, it, the X factor. Okay? It has a mystical ring to it. Uh, it is fascinating and uh, customers find it interesting as well. So think about it. The next time you want to select a name, you may want to go with the X. And these are from studies actually, yeah? from research. Now, at the beginning of my presentation, I'd asked you to write down a piece of paper, the brand name that comes to your mind or your favorite brand name. So let me just ask those around. How many of you, your brand name start with a J? Okay, what about K? Well, that's one K, all right, or two Ks, okay. Uh, is it because it's keen mind? <laughs> what about X? Anyone starts with an X, any of your brand name? Okay, what up? X? Thank you. We have a company in Germany today. Oh, wonderful. Oh, that's why you mentioned X. Thanks, Ajit. What about Y? Any Ys? Z? 
Okay? Okay, for the American, Z. All right. Now, in Malaysia, the, and, and I think in Singapore as well, there's an online retailer by the name of Zalora. And when they launched, it went into the mind of uh, specifically ladies, huh? not so much the guys. It was very memorable for them, and they launched it with a lot of impact. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that's it from me. Thank you very much for your attention, and I hope it was useful for you.